Recording Hello, has started. and welcome to the next Open UK Future Leaders training session. First, a little bit about the Open UK Future Leaders Group. The Future Leaders Group is a collection of individuals who are interested in open technologies, including open source software, open hardware, and open data. It includes a wide range of people that work in technology, intellectual property, outsourcing, procurement, data, coding, and innovation, as well as private practice lawyers and in-house counsel that work in the technology sector and related fields. It operates under the direction of the Open UK's Legal and Policy Committee and has a clear purpose to bring together and develop future leaders in legal and policy matters relating to open technology and to support and further the mission of the Legal and Policy Committee. The Future Leaders Group is currently co-chaired by me, Robert Grinnells, and I'm from Phil Fisher, and Katie Gibson from Bristow's, and we're both lawyers advising on technology and commercial matters. The group is always open to new ideas and to new members, whether getting involved in all of our activities or just dipping in and out of our various projects. And for today's session, I'm delighted to say that we're joined by John Laban from the Open Compute Project. John focuses on growth in the open source collaborative commons and wants to help realize the benefits of open source technology innovation to the circular economy and decarbonization. John has worked in the telecommunications and information transport systems industry for over 35 years uh, for a variety of well-known companies. And they're spelt a bit over the last decade as a data center architect and mentor working in microscale to hyperscale facilities, both nationally and internationally. I think it's fair to say that John is always quite keen to question the status quo and is passionate about doing things faster and better in open source collaborative communities. And so we're really happy that he's able to join us today. We'll have a chance for any questions at the end, so please pop them in the chat box and we'll invite you onto voice and video to ask them yourself if you'd like to. And John, welcome to our session today and thanks for joining us. And over to you to talk about uh, the circular economy, ICT and open source technologies. Thank you very much. And thank everybody for um, coming along. Um, one thing I always like to um, achieve at the end of my presentations is that you go away learning one new thing. So I hope you learn one new thing and um, you find it informative. So we're going to talk about the circular economy uh, of ICT and open source technologies. And here's a question you might want to ponder. Is the former circular economy ICT dependent on the latter? Now, I'm going to try and make the case that circular economy in ICT is dependent on open source technologies. So think of the questions, stick them in the chat box or prepare them for later. Uh, just to let you know that um, the Open Compute Project is about open source hardware. Uh, it started in 2011. It's now dominant in the hyperscaler data centers. And um, most people have never, ever seen an Open Compute uh, server inside a data center. But hopefully I'll show you a few today. So what's this? Answer in the chat box. Now, we're going to look at the circular economy. Probably everybody has seen that uh, green circular re reuse, uh, reduce, recycle on the left. But uh, how many of you have seen that on the right? It's um, from the, the tomb of Tutankhamun. And what it is, it's, uh, if you look, that big circle that you see going around the head, it's actually a serpent. It's a snake eating its towel. And this is circular economy in the times of the Egyptians. And just take that word at the top and go away and explore. There's nothing new about circular economy. It's just that we've been through a situation in the last 250 years where we've forgotten about the circular economy and now it's coming back. Now what I'm going to try and show you is we're going to be doing this because we're going to be slaves to the, the new economic models. Now here we've got John Maynard Keynes and great guy in, you know, probably the top economist in the last century and I love this, practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influence are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. 
Now, these are the new economists. These are the economists that are changing the economic models. And what's so interesting about them, these disruptive economists that start to question the old economic models, are a lot of them are women. So it's very interesting how a previously male-dominated profession is shifting towards women coming into the profession and they're changing the pictures. Now, what they're pushing is in their economic models is this idea of the 21st century embedded economy model. Now, the embedded economy model is where you embed society and the economy into um, planet Earth fundamentally, and you can see it there. So this is a sustainability system. And what you've got, you've got the inputs on the left, like solar energy into the, into the Earth. You've got society sitting in the Earth, and then you've got the economy in the middle. And what's interesting is this sitting in the core called the commons. Now in this model, this commons is open source technology collaborative commons. Now I just put these in because I was thinking to myself, how often are people, have they written the word commons in, in publications? And Google does this wonderful big data where you can just go and have a look on how common a word is in usage in publications. And it's interesting, this goes back way back to about 1860. And you can see the demise of the, the word commons. And there it's starting to come back up again from just before the, uh, the, the new millennium. And it's really starting to take hold again. This one uh, is a, an interesting word, patent. Again, you can see from 1860, and there's been, in publications, can you see how it's fallen away since 2000? Now here we have the embedded economy model. And here we have um, the president of the European Union. And hopefully you've all heard about the, the Green Deal. Now the Green Deal is based on the embedded economy model. The new economic model that the European Union are adopting, and again, led by women, is that we are living in a finite world and we cannot sustain the old economic models when we have a finite reserve in planet Earth. The Europeans are also pushing the concept of the open source collaborative commons. And there's um, research going on at the moment in, in Europe to create the evidence base for policies where, especially in the public sector, open source will be a must have in future purchases by public sector for ICT. Now, hopefully you'll get access to these um, slide decks later. Here we have a very good video that you can have a look at. It's uh, about a four minute video. I'm not going to play it now. And you can see the arguments uh, coming from Europe on public sector use ICT. Now, I'd like to argue something. It's vendor driven closed design is fundamentally different to user open source design. And I'll just show you some of the, um, the differences as I see them. <clears throat> so, with the, the vendor driven, we've got the built in obsolescence <clears throat> and you've got this idea of the uh, the sweet spot. And with ICT, it's a three to five year 
sweet spot for built-in obsolescence. Um, you've got something called gratuitous product differentiation as well, and I'm going to talk about power supplies and various other things. You've got uh, closed proprietary user lock-in. You've got uh, Cisco routers and the software. Um, Cisco really started as a, as a software business and fundamentally they became dominant in the internet because of the way they um, only allowed their software and there's uh, protocols you might have heard of like IGRP and the EIGRP that only ran on can you just hang on a minute? There's a chap trying to get me in. Jane, open the door and just get that parcel. Sorry, it's my um, my trousers from America. Um, another thing down on the bottom right there, you got uh, monolithic integration, where you you integrate the proprietary hardware with the proprietary software, and you get this really difficult lock-in for the, uh, the user. Now, prosumer-driven, when I talk about prosumers, I'm talking about the consumer of the, uh, the technology, uh, but they get involved with the design. Their typical prosumers in, in, in open compute are the big hyperscalers, uh, the Facebooks, the Microsofts, um, the Googles, um, the Rackspaces. And they have a totally different uh, motivation when it comes to design. And because they are of such size, they can influence the market. And this is fundamentally what's happened, that these big prosumers have changed and moved the vendors. So their motivation, dematerialization, they've got no incentive to, uh, to consume more. They just want to do something at the, the lowest possible cost. And for example, dematerialization, I'll give you some examples uh, in this about uh, the way software eats hardware. And it's quite profound. I'm talking about 90% dematerialization of, uh, of equipment in data centers. Simplicity. Um, it's interesting on simplicity, if you look at an open source uh, server, an OCP server, uh, it's tallest you can repair everything in about uh, 180 seconds and you can probably change 80% of the components in 60 seconds. It's also hackable. Now, I'm going to go on and talk about hackable. And when I talk about hackable, I don't mean about breaking security. I mean, you can rework it. Anybody can rework it if it's open. There's something else that's really key to openness, and it gives other, play other people the right to repair. At the moment, that's kind of locked out when you've got proprietary systems. And there is a big campaign going on in Europe for the right to repair. Part of that is open source firmware. If, for example, a vendor of, uh, say, a server uh, has proprietary uh, firmware and they decide they're not going to support that firmware anymore then fundamentally you wouldn't keep the hardware but once we start to move towards open source firmware and by, by the way it is available it's used by the hyperscalers and any open compute uh, server uh, as of next year 2021 must be able to support this new open source firmware and there's some really big benefits from open source firmware. Fundamentally, it's a lot more secure. But it's a very, very small file. And what's interesting, you can boot a server using open source firmware in about, I think it's about 17 seconds. Whereas with proprietary firmware, it's got all this legacy code in it. And when you boot your server and you're running this firmware it might be three to seven minutes just to boot the server so a comparison 17 seconds to minutes and then we've got the unbundling of the software from the hardware we call it disaggregation now as part of the circular economy we've got to reduce the stuff 
it's about reducing stuff. And as I say, this prosumer driven open source approach is about reduction. Something else that uh, the prosumers are keen not to introduce is what we call gratuitous product differentiation. And I'll give you some examples. Now, we get this all the time. There's a, the apple in the supermarket um, with these little plastic labels on it. Um, why are you trying to differentiate an apple? I do not know, but there we go. Now let's look at um, a power supply unit inside a, a computer server inside a data center. <clears throat> now that black box there represents the power supply unit. Normally it sits inside the server. There's normally multiple power supplies inside a single server. But its basic function is really quite simple. It takes mains alternating current inputs and it pushes out 12 volt direct current outputs to feed into the, the server electronics. Now I will ask the question, why do we need hundreds of different incompatible power supply units? And if you go onto Google Images and just put in server power supply units, you will get these images. You'll get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of power supply units. Even within the same vendor, across their product range, they differentiate the power supplies. And fundamentally, the power supply is taking an AC input and given a DC output. Now, you can also look at other gratuitous differentiation on servers. These are the bezels on the fronts of the servers. And again, go into Google Images, search for server bezels. You will find hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these bezels. Now, what's interesting about these bezels is they actually make the server work less effectively because what they do, they obstruct the airflows through the front of the server. And there was the, the case with the Dell servers a few years back where directly you installed them, you would rip the bezels off to allow better airflow flow through the, the servers. Now, I call this bullshit jobs. And what's so interesting, when you go to a server to do a repair, when you see that sign, that Dell sign, that Cisco sign, that HP sign, it just makes you angry. So I really can't understand why they do this. And as you move into open source tech driven by the prosumer, you'll find no bezels and we call it vanity free. But let's start looking a bit more at this reduction. Let's look at the data center itself. And this here is a typical traditional data center. You can see you've got the generators, the uninterruptible power supplies all centralized. You've got the cooling systems, the computer room air conditioning systems. Um, and then right at the top, you've got the, the green cabinets there, which is the data hall where you've got the IT racks. Now that's traditional. Now, what do the prosumers do? They start to rip things out. They design servers that can sustain very high inlet temperatures, so you don't need all this refrigeration cooling anymore. They implant lithium ion batteries inside the IT racks, so you don't need the centralized UPS anymore. So here we have a typical prosumer driven open source data center specification, which by the way, if you want, you can go and download this and use this for building your own data centers. This has a huge impact on the capital cost for the data center facility before you put any IT gear in. And it also massively reduces what we call the scope free emissions. Now scope free is the embodied carbon in hardware. Now, if we look at a traditional server rack, 
uh, here we have a traditional server rack. We've got the front of the rack where the arrows, the blue arrows pointing in on the left hand side here. And you've got these grey blocks, which are the servers. At the top, you've got the ethernets, which is these blue objects. And then you've got these orange things here. These are all these tiny little fans you get inside the servers. At the back of the equipment, you've got these red boxes. These are the AC to DC power supplies. You've got at least two in every single device. Behind that, you've got these green vertical strips. These green vertical strips, they, they're called intelligent power strips. And all they are is um, it's a long strip with lots of kettle sockets on it for plugging the equipment in. And then you've got the, what I'm trying to show here is the warm air coming out the back and then it comes down into what's called a crack unit just here that stands on the floor. And this crack unit takes the hot air and chills it using mechanical chilling pushes the cool air under the floor and then the cool air comes back into the front of the rack again. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to explode this diagram and convert it into uh, an open source rack. So you start to take out those little fans that uh, are inside because we don't use those little fans in um, OCP hardware. We take out the Ethernet switches at the top because we don't use the Ethernet switches to do the management in the same way as the traditional. In fact, we, we actually use a Raspberry Pi. So we take out thousands of pounds worth of Ethernet switches for the management uh, and we use a Raspberry Pi uh, which costs about $25. We throw away these green power strips at the back of the rack. Now these green power strips, by the way, are $1,000 each. $1,000 each. We throw four of those away. We throw away the crack unit because we don't need the crack units anymore. And I've actually thrown away the access floors because we don't need these access floors. And that's all the cable spaghetti that I've just taken out of the rack. Now what I've actually thrown away is this. I've thrown away this in a single rack. So I've thrown away two topper rack switches. I've thrown away the fiber optic pluggable optics, which is extremely expensive. I've thrown away 86 power supply units, those AC to DC power supply units, 208 40 millimeter fans, those expensive $1,000 AC power strips, um, all those rear kettle cords, which we call IEC kettle cords, loads of RJ45 patch cords, basically the cable spaghetti that you get in the back of the rack. I've taken out the crack units, the access floors and all the cabling in the floor. Now, just to try and put this into perspective, this is equivalent saving on a single 40 server rack a financial reduction of somewhere between ten to sixteen thousand dollars, depending on how it was configured. So these are the kind of savings, financial savings. Now just think about all the scope-free embodied carbon that's that we've that we no longer need. It's substantial. Now, what we've got here, we've got an OCP server. And we, we basically throw bits away that we don't need. We never use the graphics elements when we, we place the server inside a, a data center. Fundamentally, we reinvented the server. Lots of traditional enterprise servers are fundamentally no different from when they existed as a desktop PC that somebody picked up, put on a shelf and pushed in a rack. That's why all the cables, by the way, on traditional servers are on the back, because when they were desktop PCs, you wanted the cables on the back to fall off the back of the table.
Now, that there is a, an AC to DC power supply. These are these uh, kettle plugs. This here is the, the fancy steel case that you, you traditionally get on servers. Up here, you've got the, the graphics elements. Here you've got the, the, um, the sexy looking uh, front bezel. And here you've got the server rails. Now, what the prosumers have done, they've basically dematerialized this dough. They've just done away with them. They've just taken them out. So if you ever get to lift, carry one of these servers compared to a traditional one, you'll find it significantly lighter. And in fact, if you compared a traditional rack with uh, an OCP rack, you probably find that the saving in weight is probably equivalent to an 18 stone person being removed from the top of the rack. It's a substantial reduction in stuff. Now, what we've got here is, we've got a before and after picture. On the left here, what we've got, this is a data center from Comcast in Atlanta. Here we've got the CTO doing a presentation. You can watch this at this YouTube link. And basically what he's showing here is the traditional solution, proprietary solution. And he's showing on the right hand side, the new open source virtualized solution. Now. On the left hand side, there's 10 equipment racks. And on the right hand side, there's one. Now, this is the impact of prosumer driven open source technology. This is dematerialization at 90%. This is why all the world's telcos are gonna be adopting this technology. It saves them a fortune. It also creates the virtualized instances for them which they need to create agility to to make uh, more rapid changes but this is profound and this is why the telcos are adopting this technology now the about a year ago just over a year ago i think it was the the open compute foundation again it's a not-for-profit promoting open source hardware uh, realized the benefits of this open source tech and how it can be reused in a second market after it comes out the hyperscalers. And there's a huge economy now, circular economy on these. Uh, go onto the Open Compute website, look at um, <clears throat> the circular economy pages, uh, download this report. This is from IT Renew, and you'll see the scale of the millions of servers that are now coming out the hyperscalers and being reused in secondary markets. Um, if anybody wants to know more about this detail on this, then Steve Helvey is the, the man. You'll find him on the OCP website as well, Steve Helvey. Now, let me give you some examples of this, uh, this reuse. <clears throat> now, what you've got here, you've got a company called Block Heating. It's a new startup in in Holland, up on the top left there, you've got the uh, the founder, Jerome. He's an amazing guy. And he always uses second user equipment. Now, what he's done, he's taken here on the left-hand side, he's taken air-cooled OCP servers, these vanity-free servers. He's, he's consuming them from the Facebook data centers and what he's doing, he's hacking them, he's converting them from air cord to water cord. And then what he's doing, he's taking this hot water and the water's coming out of the server at 63 degrees centigrade. And he's taking this water, he's co-locating these OCP data centers in amongst these large greenhouses in Holland. And then they're using the 63 degree water to warm greenhouses to grow tomatoes cucumbers and peppers. Now what's interesting about this, this massively reduces his costs. And he is selling cloud services and at substantially lower costs 
than other cloud service providers can because effectively he's eliminating his costs for his electricity with the deal that he does with the greenhouse. So he'll be selling cloud services at least 30% lower cost than your traditional players. So the economics works if you do the joined up thinking on the environmental and the circular economy. Now, another company that's worth looking at is this is OVH. I think OVH are one of the most innovative cloud service providers around today. And by the way, they are huge. They're a French company and they are huge. They probably have in excess of half a million servers in their estate and some of the biggest data centers in the world. Now, here we have a picture of Octave Klaber. He's the founder. He's a very, very interesting guy. And his philosophy is, well, if I can reuse stuff, that's what I'm going to do. And what you can see here behind him, these are OCP air-cooled servers that he's hacked, he's modified for liquid cooling. And everything he does and everything that, that they innovate there is different. A conventional rack, you pile the servers vertically upon each other, 40 high. Well, they don't do that. They've worked out that it's you can do it having uh, laying the rack in a way on its side because then they can stack these racks one on top of the other in these wow. data centers. Now, as a consequence of doing this, this modification, they massively reduce the cost of building the data center facility because when they convert these second use servers to liquid, to water, they massively reduce the infrastructure needed in the data center to take all the hot air away because now it's just passing water through pipes. And another philosophy they have is they, they don't build new data centers. They take on these industrial units that have been previously used, providing there's the power there. And they basically just modify them as data centers. So they're not building new. Well, just to put this into perspective, this approach means that they could build four data centers for the price of one new, what we call tier three data center. So like 75% cost reductions. And this is not just happening here with OVH, this is also happening in um, Sweden as well. Now, if we look at OVH and how they can sell, what we've got here, we've got a chart. It shows the monthly cost of virtual machines across cloud service providers. And what's interesting here, we've got OVH in blue. And you can see their cost is they're selling these virtual machines at a very low price. Now, what's interesting, Amazon is here in green, and there's Amazon here. Now, Amazon has huge scale, but they're not focused on the reduction of stuff in the same way and the circular economy approach that OVH are. So what you can see here, OVH, have this environmental business advantage as a result of the way they look at their solutions. Now, lots of people think that you have to spend more money to be green, and I think that's totally wrong. And here we've got Jamie Lerner, and I love what he says. He says, if you want creativity, take a zero off your budget. But if you want sustainability, take off two zeros. Now, I've given you examples of how you get 90% dematerialization of hardware. There's numerous other things I, I can tell you about. Now, that's the end of my um, slides. There are lots of other slides to to look at later so hopefully you, you'll get access to this um, and now if anybody wants to ask any questions then um, let's um, see you coming on board to to ask them please thank, thank you so you. much yes has anyone got any questions yeah. any in the chat yet
No questions? I've got one if um, there's no one else coming forward. Um, why, why do you think um, some of the big players aren't making more of a thing of this? Um, why do you think they are still sort of, uh, it was a, quite an impressive graph thing you showed there of sort of where you've got Amazon and people like that really not competing in this area and sort of really not sort of actually recognizing this is actually a really valuable thing. Why, why do you think they haven't capitalized on this? Is it something they, they can't do or they're just not bothered? They think they've got other things that they can kind of capitalize on that sell their product or a combination of all the above or none of the above? Or... Well, one of the supplementary slides, um, let me see if I can find it. One of these supplementary slides, oh no, you can have a look at it later. And it, it talks about myo myopic marketing. And it's a mindset that companies that are in a dominant position in a growing market adopt. They get too rich and they, they don't innovate and they nice. disconnect from their customers and they just carry on the same old way. And I think that's the problem with Amazon that they they're dominant, they're rich, and when you're rich, you waste stuff. Whereas if you take OVH and these new startups, they don't have much capital <laughs> and they're looking at how they can break into a market and they are innovating in incredible ways. You won't see like uh, um, Amazon don't really do heat reuse. And if you do heat reuse, you can lower your electricity costs by about 40% because you're sharing that uh, that cost with somebody else, like the greenhouse, for example. Mm -hmm. So, and, and a very large part of your cost is uh, is it is the cost of electricity. So I think it's someone said to me once the concept of myop, myopic uh, marketing of these big established players is. And by the way, they're all doomed to die. And there's a wonderful paper, if you want to read it, by Levitt. It was written in 1960 in the Harvard Business Review. It's called Myopic Marketing. And he, he, he puts it down that people get into this kind of mindset. Um, and I remember sitting talking to um, uh, an engineer for a very large dominant microprocessor manufacturer. Um, and uh, he, he said, um, we struggle to innovate. And what we do, because we struggle to innovate, because there is this problem that when a large corporate innovates, it's basically going to destroy its business if it's disruptive technology. So it's not really motivated uh, to do it. So what you'll see, these big um, players, these big traditional brands, what they do, they acquire companies. They acquire these new innovators. But then what they do, they create this concept of, it's called the creosote tree. Now, I, don't, I don't know if you've ever heard of it. A creosote tree is a tree that grows in like the Arizona desert in North America. And because the soil was so bad, it mustn't have any competition underneath. So what it does, it drips creosote onto the ground to kill off any other growth. So what these big corporations do, they acquire these new innovators, they put them underneath and then they poison them. And kill everything else around them, yeah. <laughs> so, and this is really what, and, and it's so funny watching this because I haven't mentioned where all these manufacturers are coming from and making all this open source technology, but most people listening to this uh, uh, session will have never heard of them. Will have never heard of them. Most people have probably never heard of Inspur. Inspur is, it's just so huge a company now um, and it just makes all this stuff for the hyperscalers because the hyperscalers consume huge amounts of servers, probably in excess. The top six hyperscalers, um, Google, yeah, let's throw Facebook in on this as well. Um, and the big ones in China, Beidou, Microsoft, Tencent, um, Alibaba, they probably consume, I don't know, in excess of one third of all the servers that are made every year. Just those six companies. <laughs> they have they have huge infrastructures. Um, and while that's happening, the, it's killing off all the traditional enterprise data centers that people used to have themselves. Um, um, 
But what I find really funny is the people that are in the old traditional enterprise on-premise data center business are really struggling. They're really struggling. There's huge potential for business in the open source, but they won't move. And I just watch them and it's this myopic, uh, we had it good once. And the way we're gonna, we're gonna keep doing this, even though we're gonna get rid of 50% of our staff because we can't support them anymore. <laughs> and they just carry on. And I, I used to believe that um, you could go and talk to them and say, there's a huge opportunity here. There's like, there's 100,000 telephone exchanges just in Europe that need converting. But that, no, they won't come over. And so you just say, well, okay, let's just watch it, watch them go. So John, it's, a, it's a mindset thing. It's really a mindset thing. I've got a bunch Thanks, of John. questions for you, but just listening to your answer to Rob's question, if you watch the Microsoft lead talking about open source software, and I don't know how many years ago it was, I guess a dozen that Steve Ballmer described open source software as a cancer. Today yeah. you see Sasha Nadal asking to be judged on their actions of today and the future because he wants that, that piece of history to be ignored by the open source community and the, the relations we have going forwards. Microsoft explained the journey they've been on getting to open source on a basis of three reasons. Um, they say that it, it's down to the fact that back then, 10 years ago, customers didn't ask for open source and today they all do. They say it's because the developers have grown up in the last 10, 20 years post Linux kernel in 1989 um, with open source as a norm. So the way that they work, the methodologies they adopt are open source. And if they wanna hire those guys, they have to work that way. But I think the third one, I don't normally tell them in that order and I've changed it because the third one is the one I think that's relevant to you. They always make a joke out of Azure and they say, hey, we've got this product Azure and you might have heard of it. And they say it's built on open source. So if we wanted it to be successful, we had to develop using open source. We had to be able to contribute back. We had to understand how those products and packages worked. And that I think is fundamental. They're not pretending it's uh, simply for the greater good that they've put this investment into open source. There is a solid, solid business case for it. Do you think that that's going to be the transition we see in the hardware space and that it's just a case of these big guys catching up, they're slower to catch up? Well, it's interesting about Microsoft. Um, there was some huge things happened last year in, in the big purchases in, in open source, like Microsoft buying GitHub, um, IBM buying Red Hat. I, I'm talking about the deals that happened last year in, in acquiring open source businesses by the big players, which might end up being a kind of a creosote tree moment in some way. It might, they might kill them. Um, they may do. Uh, but it was like a hundred, over 100 billion probably in, in, in deals. Uh, Red Hat was 34 billion on its own and, and there was loads of other things going on. Susie have just uh, acquired um, Rancher. Um, now, those slides I showed you of the data center facility, they're actually Microsoft slides <laughs> presented at the OCP Foundation as a keynote. And why are they doing it? Because it saves them an arm and a leg in cost. And if they don't move this way, if they carry on the old way, they'll just bankrupt themselves no matter how rich they are. So they have totally and radically changed the way they build their own infrastructures. And by the way, they use the OCP hardware. <laughs> so Microsoft have really fallen in with this. And fundamentally, their new, you know, the, the guy who's leading Microsoft today, he's a, he reminds me a little bit like a Buddhist monk in a way. He's uh, totally different to the old, the old school where you had uh, Bulmer running around like a rugby player on the stage, uh, saying everybody was a parasite if they were using this. Uh, it, that open source was a cancer. And this was always there. And I kind of say when people get angry about a technology that's entering a market, whether it's open source or some other disruptive technology, there's a very good way to know how effective that technology is going to be in the future. And it, you base it on it's something called the Kubler-Ross change curve. Now, the Kubler-Ross change curve is quite interesting. It's if somebody close to you dies, 
you go through these emotional changes, these phases of emotional change. And first of all, you kind of get into this, well, I don't believe it's happening. <laughs> I don't believe, and you go into this disbelief. Mm -hmm. And then you go through the next kind of stage and it's you get angry, you get really angry. And when I see people getting angry about open source technologies, whether it's software or hardware, I just know they're moving and I feel hopeful for them. But if they stay in the denial stage, they're the ones that are going to die. Um, so they have to go through these phases. And I love it when I do a presentation that I leave people in the depressed stage, because when you get down to the depressed level, then the only way is up. But you've moved them through the Kubler-Ross curve. And then once they've got into this low position, then they can start to kind of start moving up again. But they, they have to jump the technology boundaries and get into these new technologies. There's a lot to unpack in what you just said. Um, I don't know if you were on the calls. We had Olivier Mays, who is the European MD of Rancher, who you mentioned were acquired this year by Suze. I think that acquisition is just finishing on the call two weeks ago, talking a bit about that acquisition. And last week we had uh, Frank Karlaschek, the founder of OwnCloud and NextCloud. And the stories are all tied together. Something we don't talk about a lot in the legal community um, is something you raised there about the Red Hat acquisition and the GitHub acquisition and your creosote tree. So one of the things that I've actually advised on back in the day when I was a lawyer in private practice was a startup that was going under that had open sourced its technology. And of course, they were able to take that technology and rebuild because it was there for the next venture. And Frank Karlaschek, who was on last week, actually forked his own company, OwnCloud, to create NextCloud, walked away from 10 million of investment, you know, big, brave move. It's really interesting to see the dynamics play out. But I would hope that Red Hat and GitHub are, to a large extent, at least protected because the mm. community has the ability to fork if those uh, acquirers go in a different or the wrong direction away from open with those technologies. Um, you, you're talking a lot there about the adaption and the constant disruption. Why are we not seeing a bigger response in the UK? I mean, there have been some UK uh, tech business people joined us today on this call to listen to you, John. Why do we not have an OVH? Why are those companies not coming from the UK? Um, I always have to be very careful what I say about uh, organisations that are driven by um, the big the big vendors. Um, what's their motivation? Their motivation is not not to kind of eat themselves, you know, I showed the two different mindsets in that uh, presentation between the prosumer mindset, which is all about reduction um, and dematerialization. Well, the vendor's mindset is is not that, it's about uh, production, it's about volume, it's about selling stuff. And uh, I don't think we've really got in the UK much in the way of pro prosumer driven um, foundations. Uh, I, I just don't think it's, it's, it's not there. Now, why are OVH so good? And why are the French so good at open source tech? I think this is um, a policy that was taken by the French government way back in 2014, where they, sta they stated that uh, the policy was, if open source software is available for any publicly financed uh, uh, ICT, then it should be used. And what's interesting, there's a, it's a very interesting market in France and a lot of the innovations I'm seeing on, on OCP, in fact, OCP was adopted first in France as the, the, where it all kind of started. Um, and what's interesting, if you look at some of the French companies, um, OV, OVH is the biggest cloud service provider by far, uh, HQ'd in, uh, in Europe. But there's another company that's worth looking at, and it's called uh, Thales. And if you just Googled open source Thales, so it's T-H-A-L-E-S, and you will find they employ 9,000 open source software engineers. Now, they are huge when it comes to military. 
because they're also pushing open source into the military. So they're adopting RISC-V processes. Everything's open source on the software. And the French have this kind of attitude. They have it's in their kind of culture now towards uh, open source tech. And there's some really innovative companies of substantial size in France, but nobody seems to know about them. And I find that some of the best innovations in open source across the whole of Europe uh, is in France, and it's been going on for a long time. There's, there's one company that uh, not many people knew about. It was a relatively small company. It got acquired by an American company uh, just under two years ago. And it was 13 people, 20 kilometers south of, uh, of Paris, near Versailles there. And they were called Splitted Desktop crazy name and basically they were just you go into their offices and it was like going into kind of a university experimental uh, electronics lab now these are the people that started taking the facebook ocp data center servers and repurposing them into second user markets now these 13 people when they got purchased they were shifting about a thousand servers a week it's just quite phenomenal what they were doing there. If you're shifting a thousand servers a week into, you know, data centers, traditionally you're of a size where you employ thousands of people. And they were doing this with like 13 people. And this company that came in, you can look at them on the website called IT Renew, um, uh, just acquired them. And the, the whole business is just exploding. And, they were supplying gear into um, OVH. So it's, it's, it's an interesting time ahead. Thank you so much, John. That sounds like a good note to end today's session. So thank you so much again for your time and delivering such an interesting presentation. Next week, we've got Amanda talking about uh, Brexit, <laughs> getting dangerously close, um, and the geo geopolitical shift and the future of open. So I hopefully see lots of you there. And thanks again, John. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thank you.